Okay, so that was a little bit about, uh, about DDT. Again, DDT, one of those substances that we thought of as a salvation thing, a really, really cool thing, something that was going to uh, have a lot of upside with very little, if any, downside. DDT appeared to act only on invertebrates, appeared to not affect uh, mice or horses or dogs or you. We now know that's not true, but um, short term, it primarily impacted um, animals. So let's, before we talk about that, though, before we keep talking about that, let's let's go back and talk about the history of poisoning. This is how we have thought about poisoning for most of our history. Well, actually, so so the science of poisoning comes from Europe. Thank you, Europe and from the old royal houses in, in uh, Europe, which if you were a king or royalty, you had to marry other royalty, right? And so if you were uh, the firstborn, you had a shot at being the king or queen, as it were, right? However, if you were the third or fourth or fifth born, you probably weren't going to be the head honcho, right? Because you, you're, you're, you were stuck in last place or middle of the line. So poisoning became a very popular way for you to become king. So the royal courts of Europe were really became increasingly skilled in harder to detect poisons and how much of a poison would do this and how much of a poison would do that. So the, the modern field of the study of poisons, which we call toxicology, really was birthed there. The, the modern thinking about stuff, applying modern scientific principles, really got going in a big way at the turn of the last century in New York, when folks in a, essentially police investigations started to, to um, do more experimentation to figure out if they could track down the source of, of poisoning. Um, built into all of that is our traditional or classic view of poisoning. And that has to do with dose and response. So dose meaning the concentration or the amount of the potential toxic substance. And then response is, is what we're going to see. That response could be in terms of outright death and dying of critters. It could be um, uh, make you sleepy. You know, there, there could be set, the, the, the response isn't necessarily death but it's, it's some manifestation in the organism that we're talking about. So the simplest way is a linear response, something like this. Oops, something like that, right? So uh, a li little bit of increase pr produces a, a linear increase in the response. We can also see shapes of curves like this or like this, right? And, and all kinds of complex shapes. But inherent in all of these things is we start out with some level of exposure. And at some level higher up, it, it causes significant problems. Inherent with this is the notion that at some low level, at so le some low level, there's a little teeny bit of substance which either doesn't hurt you or produces so little amount of hurt that it's indistinguishable from the background, okay? And at some maximum level of exposure, it always causes something detrimental. <coughs> and so much, much, much of the history of looking at poisoning and toxicity and pollution is built around are, are you a type 1 curve, a type 2 curve, a type, you know, are, are you the kind of thing where with substance we give a little bit more, a little bit more, like, like say this guy here, a little bit more, a little bit more concentration, maybe we double it and we see very little response in the, in the organism and a little bit more, just a little teeny bit and then you have to really get it up high to really start to see significant results or is it the type of substance where little teeny bit of increase produces a, a large response early on, right? And so that's how we've approached things. And that's what most of our legislation and policy are built around. So if we have a little bit, uh, so in other words, it's all trying to keep the amount of toxins in the environment 
or that would potentially be exposed, uh, that you would be exposed to, or an organism would be exposed to, to down here on this edge of the spectrum, right? So a lot of the research is, hey, what's the concentration that produces, you know, a significant effect, and then let's walk back from that. Unfortunately, and, and while that, that still happens, that's still a totally valid way to go about doing stuff, increasingly we're finding a whole suite of compounds that do not follow this. So let me, this is really important you guys understand this. So this is a, a new class of poisoning, a new, a new way to get poisoned that we've not really understood before. And we find, out, find this out because of DDT. So DDT happens, and as you guys saw from those videos we were looking at a second ago, um, right? It, it's this miracle substance. It's, it appears to attack the things we don't like, the mosquitoes, the flies, and doesn't hurt our puppy. So we, we basically produce a ton of DDT, pumped it out in the environment in a whole variety of, of ways, shapes, and forms. And initially, it seemed great, right? We took care of the insect problem. We controlled the mosquitoes in the wetland, etc. As you guys know, and is, is famously uh, uh, championed by Rachel Carson in, in her famous book, Silent Spring, after a while we started noticing some unintended consequences of this, most notably bird populations starting to crash. Bird populations starting to crash because those birds had metabolized, had taken up that DDT, and that substance messed with their physiology. The most obvious way it messed with their physiology was in their ability to lay proteins down that formed the shell of their eggs. And so when mom or dad, so they laid an egg and there's a baby in there, then when mom, and, mom or dad sat on the egg to incubate it, keep it warm, the egg was so structurally weakened as to the mom or dad's weight of sitting on the egg, which is they've done for millions of years, right, and all that kind of good stuff. Actually, they were crushing the eggs and the babies were dying. So you know, it happens once, it's uh, not so great. But if it happens for a long time, if it happens for the whole season, if it happens for many years, we start to see fewer babies entering the population, and that's what we saw. And that was the, the nucleus of Rachel Carson's book, and indeed the, the title, Silent Spring, meaning this little wetland pond area actually does not have any bird, doesn't have any insects buzzing, but also doesn't have any birds singing. So that, that helped uh, beat the drums for more tighter environmental controls and birth, helped birth a modern environmental movement and all this and that that you guys know about, past laws. We eventually banned DDT for, for general use in the 1970s and okay, we're, 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 everybody thinks we're fine. Then we started seeing, um, you know, uh, the eggs, the eggs weren't as thin anymore. Eggshells weren't as thin anymore, etc. So people thought, "Woo, okay, we solved that problem. Let's go on." Then we started realizing there were other problems. So one of the first uh, signals that we found that there were some other problems were um, researchers looking at gull populations, seabird populations, started noticing that, "Huh, what's going on out here? Um, we don't seem to have any babies being born." In this case, not eggs laid and then mom or dad crushing the eggs and finding you know a dead chick, dead embryo, broken shells, but actually there's no eggs being laid. Couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out. Um, now a lot of birds, are, some birds are sexually dimorphic. The male is bigger than the female or has different feathers than the female. And it's, from afar we can tell that's a male mallard, that's a female mallard. Not all birds though. And so in the case of many of our gulls, for example, it's hard, from a distance, it's hard to know, is that a, a boy or a girl? So it took the researchers a little while to figure out, but eventually they started measuring these birds and they found that what they, what they saw, what they thought were two, two birds on a nest, a male and female, turns out a lot of times they weren't male and female, they were two females. And so these so-called lesbian gull colonies they're like, what's going on? So the reason they're not, eggs aren't being laid is because they're essentially, they're starved for males in the population. Aha, okay, so that's the problem. So why are we not getting 
males. What's going on? So normally in these gold colonies, you get expect something like roughly a one to one male to female ratio. And we're getting widely skewed populations that were skewing heavily, heavily female. When folks started doing dissections of these seabirds, what we found, so most of these birds highly, you know, flight is a really cool thing. Flight is an amazing thing. Flight is challenging. So birds have a lot of adaptations to fly. They have oftentimes hollow, uh, hollow bones, so they're lighter and all these things. One of the things that many birds have is they have but a single gonad. So instead of having, say, two ovaries, you have one ovary, and it's usually a little bit more in the middle of the body, so when the bird flies, it's balanced. What we started finding in these lesbian gull colony situations, when you cut these birds open, the females would have two ovaries. Or you would sometimes find one with both male and female traits. So there'd be a testicle and an ovary, and things that were like very, very strange. And after a lot of research, what we, what we realized was what was going on was the breakdown products, the secondary metabolites, the, the daughter compounds from DDT were having physiological activity in these organisms, principally things called DDE and, and, and some related compounds. But the point is these, these birds were being exposed to high levels of DDT and initially that was so high that was screwing with mom's ability to lay egg shell down. Then we, we you know, kind of shut that down and the concentration of DDT got less, so mom was able to lay down an actual eggshell, but it didn't necessarily, her body burden, meaning the amount of this toxic substance in her tissues, and, and DDT is, is lipophilic, so it likes to hang out in your fat. So in fact, all of us have DDT in our, in our fat right now. Awesome, great. Eskimos up in, up in you know, Nupiat up in Alaska have DDT in their tissues and folks all around the planet. So everybody, polar bears have DDT in their tissues. So DDT is so widespread across the planet. There's this small concentration to be sure, but, but it's present in almost everyone. So, uh, uh, where was I? So, um, okay, so, so DDT, eggshells stop being as thin, but those, that baby is still that embryo that's developing is still being exposed to a relatively high concentration of these DDD, DDT daughter compounds. And it turns out the structure of this stuff mimics estrogens. Chemically, it is shaped like sex hormones. And so these sex hormones, uh, we now understand, are having this very uh, complex interaction with the development pathways of the baby bird. And essentially it was giving a signal, hey, you should, you should be female. So if you were already female, you got super female, right? You got two ovaries. If you were a male, you got feminized. And so all these, all these things were, um, were happening. The crazy thing is, the, this activity of this subst these substances, which we now can call the, the category of substances, environmental estrogens. So there are things out in the environment that we can be exposed to that have estrogenetic activity. Everybody with me on this one so far? Okay, so the, the crazy thing is this old dose response curve doesn't necessarily work for these substances. So the activity, and, and we're, we're, this is still a, a really active area of research, we're still trying to figure this out, because the, constant, the activity, the concentration at which these substances show biological activity are sometimes parts per million, in some cases, parts per billion. So up until the last few years, we haven't even necessarily had the, the, the chemistry techniques to actually <coughs> measure the correct concentration of these substances because they're so, they're so low. So what we find out now is with some substances, this traditional dose response curve is the way to talk about what's an appropriate level of the pollutant or the toxicant. But now what we're seeing with these environmental estrogens is timing is incredibly key. So for example, we can have a baby rabbit 
little embryo rabbits starting to develop in mom's womb. And we can expose that rabbit to whatever, I don't know, 14 parts per billion of this substance, right? And we could, we could bathe that baby rabbit in that substance uh, on day seven that the rabbit's developing into, a, or, or the embryo's been dividing, right? And no effect. Ba rabbit's born and rabbit's totally cool. You can do the same thing at day eight, no effect. Day nine, no effect. Day 10, no effect. Day 11, no effect. Day 12, total change rabbit. Either dead rabbit or malformed arms or, ch or, or changed sex organs or, or all these things. Day 13, same concentration, no effect. Day 14, no effect. So these substances are interacting with the development of organisms, but in, in, in there's this, the best way to describe it is the orchestra of development or, or the, you know, the complex dance of, of development. Because we're all these, this tissue is turning into that tissue and this and that, and it's all a complex signaling dance with different compounds. So if that, if that key of that particular toxin gets in at the right spot, it can change how the, the tissue develops and, and, and interfere with the regular, otherwise normal development pathways of those critters. So that is a crazy thing that we're starting to realize. And one of the large categories of environmental estrogens are plastics and plasticizers. So we've just been talking about microplastics and, and, and plastic debris in the ocean. As these substances enter the food chain, the potential to have estrogenetic effects is fairly high. The last thing to say about this stuff is that um, the general approach to toxic substances in the United States is to allow anything to be produced until we know something is harmful, right? And the idea there is to foster industry and foster innovation and a lot of our industrial chemical um, industry has been built around, hey, we should be able to make all these products. If we know something's bad, we'll, we'll pull it back and we'll regulate it. So what that does is that puts the burden on looking for biological activity of these substances on, on you. You to prove that this thing is a bad thing. So we're not taking precautionary principles, which is to say, hey, we're not gonna use something until we've done some tests and are relatively assured that it's safe, but rather you can use it until somebody tells you it's, it's not safe. And so that's the approach we've taken to public policy in terms of, of toxins, is that you can use whatever substances you want unless we actually have direct evidence that it's problematic. And, and there's so many thousands and thousands of compounds that are invented and patented every year it's extraordinarily difficult to screen all those substances. It was a challenge in the past to screen when we were primarily looking at dose response curves, but with this whole other new category of, of toxins, which are primarily synthetic compounds that we've manufactured since World War II, you know, the, the, the possible it, 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 it's almost impossible to figure it out, right? Because you'd have to expose all these critters, not just expose them, but expose them at day one, day two, day three, day four. And that's a very logistically challenging and very costly um, enterprise. So that's the, that's the current world of ecotoxicology that we've inherited. And those are the challenges that we face. So we've, we've primarily grown up with this dose response view of environmental toxins. But now we're realizing there's many other ways that don't fit into this traditional approach uh, that potentially can cause, cause harm, cause harm to us and cause harm to the ecosystem. So happy thoughts. All right, great. So, um, so that's, that's sort of a little bit about plastics and tox toxicity. Um, before we go on, I want to make sure that we have a quick discussion about Things other than plastic. So when you guys think about marine pollutants or coastal pollutants, 
we all, we've just talked about, right, we've talked about oil, we've talked about plastics. What are some other, what are some other pollutants that you guys think of are or might possibly be problematic? Sewage. Sewage, okay, good. Fertilizers. Uh, okay, nutrients, okay, good. Uh-huh. Odor. I'm sorry? Odor. Odor. Smells. Okay. <coughs> what else? Clothing dyes and chemicals. Okay, so, but maybe more specific, which chemicals? So dyes and? Uh, different acids they use to wash jeans. Okay, so caustic substances. What else? Phosphate, okay, good. So phosphate is an example of nutrients. Good, okay, good. What else? Sounds. Sound, good. Okay, good, oils. What else? Aha, uh -huh. okay, good. Pharmaceuticals. I'm sorry, light, light, good, light. Okay, what else? Temperature. Uh-huh. What else? Okay, that's pretty good. Um, another one that you guys didn't talk about, but which might be radiation. Uh, so, so, uh, um, Yeah, so, so basically caustic substances, synthetic substances, we already talked about that, but synthetic substances. Another one you guys didn't mention which would be sediments. Um, yeah, but that's a good list. That's a good list. So the point being that pollutants, a pollutant is anything that's, that uh, is somewhere that's not supposed to be. How do we define that? That's hard to define. But so sediments, a uh, classic example, and all of these things could be added to or, or missing. Generally speaking, though, we think about adding something to. So sediments, uh, poor sediment management. We talked about Magoo and, or did we talk about Magoo? I guess that was my, uh, my restoration ecology class. But basically, um, poor sediment management can lead to high erosion situations where we have a lot of sediment coming off, or in the case of damming rivers and, and armoring the coast, cutting off the supply of sediment. That's not typically considered a pollutant, but changed, changed material flows. Sound, incredibly important. We've, we've, uh, we've looked at the sound environment in the Santa Monica Mountains. We can only go, what the hell is it? I have to remember. Half mile or kilometer? I think, I think we can only go in to any of our sites in the Santa Monica's for uh, a maximum of a half mile where, wherein roadway sounds de decline. Once you get a half mile in, the sounds start to go up because there's so many roadways, there's so much fragmentation in the Santa Monica Mountains that you, the sound is coming from everywhere. So sound is a ubiquitous thing. We think of sound also in terms of ship noise, in terms of, so, so there's sort of the boom, explosion kind of sound, which is problematic, but there's also this constant hum, dr drum of our society. It comes from cars, comes from industry, comes from um, uh, boats and all that kind of stuff. Pharmaceuticals, the term, the term you guys will see is a CEC. Um, compound of emerging concern. And so this is, well actually let's, let's come back to that. Okay, uh, let's go light. So light, clearly light. Um, we can have uh, too much light and that can um, blind some critters or flood their sensory system so they can't see. Others might be attracted to the light and they might be, be lured in. 
Um, temperature, uh, most typically we think about temperature in the context of things like power plants that are having cooling towers that have sucked in water, change the temperature of the water uh, because of some industrial process, and then have released that water or air um, at, at an altered temperature, typically it's, it's warmed, but in theory it could go the reverse as well. Um, okay, radiation is radiation. It's, you know, uh, radionucleotides and stuff like that. Uh, oil, we talk about oil, plastic, we talk about plastic. Sewage, sewage is a great thing. So when we ask people, um, uh, you guys should, over Thanksgiving dinner, if you're with someone older than 30 and you want to not talk about the election, you should ask folks what they think about water quality here in Southern California. Is are stuff getting better, medium, or worse? And uh, it depends who you talk to. If you talk to surfer guys, like my, uh, what the hell do you call that? Uncle in law? Uncle in law, I guess. Is a, uh, I don't know, I don't think my wife's uncle. Is that an uncle in law? What the hell do we call that? Okay. Anywho, so he's a shaper. He's a, he's a surfboard uh, shaper. And um, he's an old guy. And you talk to him, he's like, Jeez, he kind of has one tooth left. But he's like, jeez, it was so much better than water now. And so he's talking about in the 60s and 70s when they used to go out and surf in Santa Monica and in LA and be surfing through poop, right? Like actual, not like poop. It's gross. Um, so clearly, clearly we've made vast improvements in terms of, at least in the US, in terms of raw sewage and that kind of. Uh, stuff so that that's that's to be congratulated we've, we've made um, a lot of progress there but nevertheless we still have problems now we're typically seeing this in places like California is in our aging infrastructure so one of the key things in the, in the uh, election and talking about the next couple of years is a lot of people talk about investments in infrastructure and part of that is not just streets and bridges but actually our our infrastructure for moving substances around and sewage pipes are, are really really um, important part of our public health system that are that most of them went in 100 years ago, 75 years ago, 80 years ago, and they're especially in the coastal zone. We have a lot of salt water and salt air and stuff. They're rusting. A lot of those are metal and they're they're like not well maintained. So the number one reason we have beach closures in Southern California is because of failed uh, uh, the sewage line breaks and you have raw sewage instead of being transported to the the treatment facility, it, it just goes out the manhole and goes into the stream, into the water, or, or what have you. So sewage um, is a much lower, is, is, is a much um, smaller problem than it was back in the day, but it still is a problem even for us here in the US. Nutrients are a huge thing. Uh, we're basically fertilizing the planet. Um, primarily we're talking there about uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, but um, uh, problematic. Uh, algal blooms, all that kind of stuff. Smells are an interesting one. The smell is similar to sound. That's something people don't typically talk about. But um, again, for organisms that are, um, well, one for you guys enjoying the area. If it smells like a sewage site, you probably don't want to hang out there. Um, but also for organisms, smell is, can be an important w uh, way to locate mates and and smell predators and all this and that. So, so both bad smells, but also just the noise of human smells, that sort of cacophony of, of stuff where they can't reliably use their olfactory senses. That's, that's a problem. Uh, dyes and other substances, I, I would put that sort of in the industrial chemical category. Acoustic stuff, same type of thing. Um, so synthetic substances and pharmaceuticals. So last one we'll talk about are, are these contaminants of emerging concern. So what does contaminant of emerging concern mean? It means whatever the fuck you want it to mean. It's this, it's this catch-all bag of stuff that doesn't fit in these other categories. Primarily we're talking about synthetic, mostly organic compounds. It can be pesticides, can be um, birth control pills, can be antibiotics, can be uh, you know, solvents in theory, can be anything. The term, which is originally coined as a phrase just to mean other, 
you know, kind of like a, is it this, 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 or other? Um, is, is taken on a more robust um, uh, meaning in the last couple years. One, again, because we have the ability to detect these substances at very low concentrations. And, and this term is emerging concern. So this means we don't have any regulation about this material. Everything else, oil, uh, whatever, nutrients, you know, acids and stuff, there, we all typically have some guidelines. Copper, heavy metals, whatever. There, there's, there's, some, there's some guidelines that says, hey, if you're above this, that's problematic level. This is stuff that, generally speaking, has very, it has activity at very, very low concentration. So it could be parts per million, could be parts per billion. So in many cases, the typical labs that analyze water quality can't measure this. Yet only a subset of labs can actually do this stuff. And it usually takes them a lot longer. It usually costs way more, way more money. And so, so we don't know what the right level is. We don't know what the dangerous level is. But people are concerned for intellectual reasons or from some preliminary experimental reasons or suspicions because it's like another family of compounds that we know have, we have problems with. And so uh, contaminants of emerging concern are, are a huge area. So now we've, we've just started this project where we're sampling waterways up and down the state to try to figure out what, just what's there. So at this level, we're just documenting the different levels that were there and we're finding disturbing things. Advil in the water, antibiotics in the water, you know, birth control pill stuff in the water, uh, 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 plasticizers in the water, all these things. And we're pretty sure that it's not good that they're in the water, but we don't know the activity level. So contaminants of emerging concern are a big, are a big thing. Cool. So in general, most of these substances are regulated, or many of these typical substances are regulated by the clean, by certain acts, but especially the Clean Water Act. Um, other things like sediments are managed also by the Clean Water Act in the sense that the fact that they're in the water, they might be degrading water quality. But then other things like electromagnetic radiation are typically not regulated by Clean Water Act. Um, and so, so some of this is handled holistically. Other of these contaminant threats, pollution threats, are either not, not regulated fully or regulated in a more of a haphazard type of approach. Um, yeah, cool. Questions about pollutants or pollution in general? No, I've bored everyone and <laughs> ate, everybody, nobody's going to eat any turkey dinner. This what is causes the creatures to be attracted to the plastic? Like, is it just the fact that it was, it came from a food product or is it algae slowly grows on it? Is it POP or? I don't know. Why don't we ask some of our, some of our students in this class are working on plastics for their capstone. How cool is that? Do any of our students that are looking at plastics have any ideas about that? But Corey's like looking down the ground, like, don't look at me, don't look at me. <laughs> I was going to say, I would just assume that they would think it's a food source, like any other, any other thing. So it looks attract. like food? Are they interested, attracted to colors? Or Possibly. Things? Possibly. Other thoughts? Where, where are my plastic people? Well, I posted this group with that they uh, found out that it smells like the algae. Yeah, the group, the group from Davis or something, right? Yeah. So, 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 it, yeah. So it could, it could mimic the smell of uh, DM, DMSO, right, or something, DMSB. I posted some things on the scoop that they were. They talk about the origins of oil and how it could come from marine algae and phytoplankton and stuff. And so there might be a connection there. Could be, but probably not. But, but, but in theory, possibly. Right. Right. Yeah, so organisms are, are can clearly ingest this material. Sure. Yeah, well, in the case of sea turtles, they eat a lot of jellyfish in plastic bags. Chloe 
plastics look like jellyfish, so they stink and eat it. Yeah, so, there, so there's, there's, with larger plastic, there's potentially a visual uh, confounding thing that it might look like seaweed or jellyfish or it might it might it might um, you know accidentally or maybe by design mimic mimic uh, something that they're used to ingesting as food but I think typically we're talking about these small pieces of little microplastic and and why are those guys eating them right right so yeah so so it is clear that if you have a piece of plastic and leave it in the water, um, like right now, it looks like plastic and maybe tastes like plastic. Um, if, we, if we leave it in the water for a little while, it'll get fouled with biofilms, right? So, so microbial coatings, algal filaments, stuff like that. And instead of what appears to happen is instead of tasting like plastic, it now tastes like Whatever the fuck, the, the bacteria or the or the the algae. So it, so there's apparently a kind of seasoning, if you will, that can happen. That once these substances are floating around the water for a long enough period of time, they maybe lose some of their bad taste. It also appears to be the case that it's not necessarily that they like the way something tastes, but that coating appears to at least with some of their typical chemical sensing taste buds, if you will, um, it doesn't taste like something wrong, right? So it's like, like, like coating a pill that tastes bad, maybe we put it in a, in a coating of candy or something like that. Or if you, if you want to give your dog medicine, maybe, and the dog's like, fuck that, that doesn't taste good, right? You might put it in a treat, right? And then give it to the dog and, the dog, and swallow it down, right? Because, oh, that tastes good. So a similar thing Seem, it was very early days in this, but it seems like that might be what's going on. And what happens is when we, when we have a raw piece of plastic, the critter is more likely to take it and then see it as something foreign or whatever and, and you know, puh, spit it out. Um, so, yeah. That's as much as we know about the plastic taste. Do you know if there's any studies looking at fish density with the amount of, like, plastics in water or, like, microplastics? Like a school of fish kind of thing, you mean? I don't know, just like, because like currents, you know, they influence where the plastics are, right? So like, do you think maybe like the currents also influence like fish density? So maybe there's more fish when there's more plastics too? Uh, yeah, I, I almost, I don't know, but I'm, I'm suspecting very, very strongly that, yeah, those things are autocorrelated, so they're not independent. So, so the things that tend to concentrate the plastics are also tending to concentrate the kind of food that the fish would eat. So it, it's hard, it would be hard to separate those two things. But you can clearly ask the question, hey, when there's, uh, are plastics and fish correlated? Not that one is driving the other, but you could at least ask that question. And I bet you the answer would be, um, in the pelagic ocean, I bet you the answer is yes. In the way that we kind of influence the evolution of those methogens in the oil spill. Methanogens, yeah. Methanogens. Is there any studies or anything looking at other, like, anthropogenic Darwinism, almost, of, of uh, like, bigger species that are evolving to react just for the situations that we're creating? Uh, sure, sure. So, for example, Chromium-6. Do you guys ever see the Aaron Brockovich movie? What's it? I don't remember what it was called. Julie Roberts played the environmental activist and everything, and so, so chromium. What's that? Was it? Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Yes. So, did you see the movie called What I Just Said? Uh, so that's based on a, a real story, and in that case, the contaminant. So chromium. There's various, various uh, species of chromium, and chromium six hexavalent chromium is the most is really, pretty toxic. And it's also stuff that is um, easily dis dissolved and, and moved around in water. So if it, gets con if it gets into a water table, it can easily spread. And um, uh, what the hell is it going with that? What was the question? It's species <laughs> that hell? have evolved because of... Oh, yeah. Okay, right. So, so it turns out one of the places that we've isolated... So, so, 
So it's hard because most organisms won't, uh, it, it kills most things. So it's a pretty, really toxic thing. Um, but at Magoo Lagoon, uh, where some of, there was uh, one of the places where we used to work, it was a former chromium dumping, or not chromium dumping, it was a chromium plating shop. And so what people used to do back in the day is they plate, um, you know, a, a tailpipe or whatever it was. And then when they're done, they just take the barrel and psh, dump it out. Wh where? In the freaking wetland, because it's a fucking wetland, so who cares about wetland? So they just dump it out. So you had all this, this chromium. So we had some areas at Magoo that had, in the wetland, in the sediments, chrome was actually at mineable concentrations. It was super, super high chrome. Um, and so there was all the different species of chrome uh, there. And um, we, I saw a grad student from UC San Diego took some of the took some samples back and she actually isolated a sp uh, microbe, I think it was an archaea, um, that uh, could reduce hex of, could take chromium from chromium six and turn it into chromium four, a, a less toxic version and, and one that's more easily consumable and breakdownable. And she isolated that from our site at Magoo. And so clearly the high concentrations were selecting for variants of these microbes that could could consume that stuff. So when you're looking for stuff to treat mine wastes, microbes say to help break down mine waste, one of the places you go to is the most toxic, nasty ass mine tailings, right? And that, because that's super hot, we would say with toxicity, it's really, really strong. So it's gonna exert a strong selection pressure. It's gonna kill just about all the organisms. So if a couple survive there and live, they're gonna tend to be really abundant because nope, they're not gonna be competing with anybody else and they can either survive that environment or detoxify that environment? So the answer is yes.